Hey guys, this is Ilinka Vartik for PianoCareerAcademy.com and in today's step-by-step -step tutorial we will analyze and practice a romantic piece of a remarkable expressive power, Chopin's challenging Nocturne in C minor, Opus 48, number 1. This advanced piece is full of technical difficulties, but the real challenge is interpretation, bringing out the entire expressive spectrum encoded in this extraordinary music. We have an exciting road ahead with many mountaintops to conquer, so let's get started. As always, first we set the scene. We create a clear mental map of the piece by trying to understand its artistic concept, form and dramaturgy. This vision will guide us every step of the way as we practice, making our work more targeted, efficient and meaningful. With this piece, Chopin takes the genre of the Nocturne to a grander scale the tragic expression of a powerful grief. This is the main concept, the red wire that connects all the sections of this very complex and dramatic music. The Nocturne has an unusual, very organic ternary form. We can divide it into three main sections, conventionally naming them A, B and A1. Section A, or the exposition, ends in bar 24. The middle section, poco più lento, ends in bar 48, here. And the transformed reprise, which we call section A1, because it is very different from the exposition, even though it is based on the same theme, begins in bar 49 with the indication doppio movimento agitato. Now, why did I call this form organic and unusual? It's because the sections are closely intertwined, and each new fragment is a natural continuation of the previous one, picking up the dramatic development and taking it further. So instead of a rounded traditional ternary form with two very similar outer sections and a contrasting middle section, we have a linear development, a continuous growth that gradually brings us to the main dramatic culmination of the piece that is found between bars 65 and 71. Now let's see how this form is reflected in the dramaturgy of the piece. Do you remember what dramaturgy is? It's the narrative, the drama, the way a musical story unfolds and transforms, and also the interaction of all the emotional images. Just like a written story has a beginning, a development of the main characters, a conflict between them, a climax and a resolution, the same thing happens in every musical piece of real artistic value. As performers, our main duty is to identify this dramaturgy and express it in our playing. Otherwise, everything we do risks being boring and lifeless. This nocturne comprises a wide spectrum of images and characters, ranging from tragic resignation to dramatic collisions, from detached serenity to exaltation, from lyricism to deep grief. I could even say that this nocturne is a story of inner growth and transformation. Let's see how it happens as we move from one section to the next one. Quiet grief and hopeless pain. In my opinion, this is the main emotional image of the exposition. The tragedy can be felt from the very first notes, yet it is still a bit shy and contained. A few other nuances are added to this foundation along the way and we will discuss all of them during the practice process and part A ends with the first culmination from bars 21 to 24. This is the first little rebellion, the first attempt to fight the implacable fate. The middle section introduces a contrast of harmony and character. C minor is replaced with C major and the calm progression of the chorale takes us into the dispassionate realm of the spiritual world. The human emotions seem to have disappeared and for a little while there is peace and luminous contemplation. However, this peace doesn't last very long. In the second half of this section, a new force collides with the serene melody that was already introduced in bars 29 to 36. Like a violent wind quickly approaching from afar, this rising chromatic movement with octaves starts to overpower the melody until it completely takes over in bar 46. 
It's amazing how Chopin combines these two contrasting musical images, the peaceful melody and the tempestuous 16th note triplets. This collision, this polyphonic fusion gives the music power. The intensity builds gradually until it reaches the dramatic culmination from bars 45 to 48 that actually reminds us of the raw energy of Liszt's works. So in only 48 measures, a lifetime has passed. By this time, there is not much left from the quiet pain from the beginning. The hero of the drama has found his inner power, has risen from the ashes, so to speak, and the transformation is complete. Instead of returning to the sad atmosphere of the exposition, the reprise continues the climax. The momentum of this triplet motive is too strong to be stopped, and its inertia carries over into the accompaniment from section A1. Again, we have a fusion of two contrasting elements. The initial tragic theme of the nocturne sounds entirely different on top of the new rhythmical foundation of the restless, impetuous triplet stream. We do have pianissimo in the beginning of the reprise, which makes this entire section particularly challenging from a technical point of view. But the underlying character is still restlessness, agitato, a raw power waiting to emerge. The storyline continues, and even though it does follow the outline of the main melody, the emotional intensity is now on a whole new level. The little rises and falls of each individual phrase merge into one big wave that takes us to the pure force from bars 65 to 71. This is both the main culmination and the resolution of the piece. It is the free, uninhibited expression of all the pain accumulated in an entire lifetime. The hero lets it all out, it fills the entire space, and after the exaltation passes, we are left with the inevitable conclusion from the last six bars. Everything ends and all must succumb to the unforgiving laws of the universe. For Chopin, this meant accepting the tragedy, which is exactly what happens as the narrative ends with the three resigned and deeply sad C minor chords. What a masterful departure from the traditional ternary form and what a brilliantly outlined musical drama with its three acts comprising an inspired story of character development and transformation. This is obviously my subjective interpretation of this music and you can definitely invent other images, metaphors and associations. The important thing is to have a dramaturgy that is alive and full of meaning. And now that we know what we need to express, let's see how we can do it. This was the first phrase, and here we have three main challenges to overcome. The first one is to create this uninterrupted horizontal phrasing and a good connection between notes despite the slow tempo. The second one is to play the melody in a singing manner. And the third one is to achieve very good technical comfort in the left hand so that these octaves and chords are played in an effortless manner, not being in the way of the right hand melody, not preventing you from directing most of your focus to the theme. I would start my practice with the left hand. And as I'm playing these octaves and chords, the most important thing here is anticipation, these fluid transitions. For example, as I'm playing the first octave, I'm already anticipating and preparing the next one. And this fluid transition naturally fills in the time necessary to cover this distance. So I'm not playing in such a manner or like this, but I'm naturally distributing my movements so they feel as comfortable as possible. Always one step ahead.
this may seem easy at first glance, and indeed, there is nothing technically challenging here. However, you have to practice this very well, so that these distances feel like your second nature. Another important thing here is to train this exactness in your fingertips, so that even though here we play everything very softly, it's only the beginning of the piece, even the melody will be quite soft, so the accompaniment has to be really in the background. So despite this soft sonority, every note should sound clearly. And we achieve this by combining arm freedom and relaxation with a bit of focus here in our hand and fingers. But the most important thing is, of course, the focus of our hearing. So if you can visualize every note, every chord very well, rehear it, especially when you practice hands separately, this will really accelerate your progress. And it's very important to not forget about phrasing when you practice the left hand. Even though we don't have a melody here, just some accompaniment chords, still you have to visualize this uninterrupted line that is very horizontal and see this development of the musical idea in perspective. So you're not playing one chord at a time. Always see what's happening ahead. When you can play the left hand effortlessly without any tension, don't forget that the tension usually arises when you're not sure of what you're doing, when there's still some novelty involved, some clumsiness. So as you become comfortable, freedom will appear in everything you do. And when this happens, you can start practicing the right hand. Let's start with the musical image we want to create. This will make everything we do more targeted. I don't recommend playing the first phrase with a very deep, super singing tone straight away. We will have enough time to get there as we move through the first part of the piece. Let's start in a more intimate way, as if we're still testing the territory, as if we're still careful in expressing this inner pain that is reflected in this music. So the pain is there, but it's really contained. Now let's see what we need to do from a technical point of view. For this phrase, I would keep my fingertips just a bit flat. This will prevent the sound from being too piercing, too expressive straight away. At the same time, I'm playing in a free, fluid manner, with the arm behind each note, even though I'm not channeling a lot of weight here, obviously, because this is a soft sonority. And now the most important thing, even when I'm playing these first two notes that are separated by rests, I make sure that my inner hearing carries the musical idea over the rests and connects everything into one sentence. So as I play this G, I'm already pre-hearing the A flat and I hear this connection between sounds and then back to G and from here we actually have physical legato and we still create this uninterrupted connection. As you play the melody from here, use the intoning technique feeling how each note is being transferred into the next one. And this is done not only with the help of wrist navigation and also by using a gradual and non-percussive touch. First and foremost, it is done with your mind, with your hearing. So if you can visualize how this G is being transferred into the D and so on, then it will be easier for you to polish your movements until they allow you to bring out this vision. I make sure there is as much freedom in my arm as possible. I navigate everything horizontally. I avoid vertical wrist movements here. And obviously, in order to achieve not only your sound goals, your phrasing goals, but also this freedom, you'll have to practice quite a bit. 
Again, there is nothing technically difficult here. However, from an expressive point of view, this requires a lot of work. But considering that this is one of the most beautiful melodies ever written, every step of the way can be super enjoyable. Now let's focus a bit more about phrasing. There are actually many ways to phrase this first musical idea of the nocturne. A lot of the time we can easily identify a specific note or a couple of notes that we can consider the destination or culminating point of a phrase or the logical accent. Here I don't recommend moving towards a specific note and then away from it. Instead, you have to create this rounded wave without any specific target, so to speak. You can if you want to. The important thing is to have this horizontal movement to know where you're headed and to express it in your playing. So this is how I would phrase this. The first G is quite soft, but obviously when we'll combine both hands together, we'll have to balance the sound intensity in such a way that it's obviously brighter than the accompaniment. But this is softer than the notes that will follow. This A flat, a bit deeper, and the phrase starts to unfold. As we play the 16th notes, we can make just a tiny crescendo, just enough to give the melody direction. And here with these repeated C's, here we actually have a little challenge because if we play like this, for example, moving towards the C, there is a risk of interrupting the flow of the phrase. So on one hand, you are moving towards here, but as you play this first C, you keep going forward and then as you arrive to this G already the peak has passed and you're approaching the end and this is the conclusion of the phrase really softly but still a lot of clarity has to be present here and this grace note should not be played too melodiously in this case but not too short either Again, if you activate your hearing very well, everything will sound just right. Play the right hand as many times as needed until you achieve this technical comfort, expressive comfort. You can do it with pedal, without pedal, according to your wishes. I actually recommend both methods because when we practice without pedal, we can hear everything much clearer. We can hear the reality of what our fingers are doing because the blurring effect of the pedal can be quite deceiving when we're building the foundation of the piece. When combining both hands together, we have to pay a lot of attention to our sound balance, obviously. This G has to shine above these three notes. Therefore, it is played deeper. And this freedom of key attack is very important here because if you play in a more tensed manner, closer to the keys, your sound will have a more metallic ring to it. And we have to avoid this, especially in the first phrase. So sound balance and we'll also focus on phrasing now. Moving forward from the very first note, one idea. Moving forward here, and the phrase dies down. You can also play with the overtones of these deeper octaves if you want without playing them too deeply, obviously. Let's play this one more time and now we have to remember about this inner state, this emotional image that we're trying to bring out. Remember, this is tragic, this is about this contained yet very deep pain. And as you think about this, you'll notice how this instantly transforms your playing. Hold the melody, or better said, Anticipate it always with your hearing and also monitor 
with your hearing everything you're playing in real time. So your hearing has to be at the same time one step ahead and monitoring what's going on. The next phrase is the second wave and we can play it a bit brighter. We're ascending to a slightly higher level here. You have to obviously practice hands separately, never skip this important step, but I'll demonstrate hands together straight away. Here it's important to make a meaningful connection between these two phrases. So this phrase has ended and then a new idea starts and already as you play this E flat, there is just a bit of light in this music. In the first phrase we had C minor, very sad, a minor tonality, and here we have E flat major. So a bit more brightness in the first note. Similarly in this G of the melody, now we can play it a bit brighter. The fingertip is more vertical, we channel a bit more weight here. Again we focus on filling these spaces between notes despite the slow tempo. And speaking about tempo, let's not forget we have lento here. So this piece should not be played, let's say, andante. And its pulsation has to be indeed very slow, very calm, very reserved. And yet in this calmness there should be this implacable forward movement. In my opinion, this is the most difficult thing here, especially if we talk about the first part of the piece. So you should hear this quarter note pulsation and at the same time everything is connected very horizontally. This chord was now just a bit too loud when I played it. So as we finish the phrase, you have to make sure that this chord does not interrupt the line of the melody. The second phrase already starts a bit bolder with a more open and piercing sound and then we take its development even higher. And as we reach the culmination of this phrase, which in this case we could say that it is here, we can allow ourselves to add some dramatic notes while playing and emphasize this a little bit. But it's also very important to hold your horses, not reveal too much yet. There's still a long way to go. So these are only the first shy attempts to express this pain and this tragic content. A flat even deeper and then here I like this fingering to connect with the fifth finger and as you do so again, listen how this A flows into this G. I would remind you that this is impossible from a purely physical point of view because every note inevitably fades away after being played and we have to compensate for this physical limitation of our instrument with our hearing. And the better you imagine, the better touch you will use for this note in such a way that you create this illusion of very good continuity. So, listen, move forward. And after this, these two of sharps. second notes here have to be played very clearly without arm weight with a very clear finger articulation and the phrase has ended by the way in this phrase in the left hand we have this element for the first time this quick connection between octaves played with one stroke and a little movement to the right. These two phrases form like an introductory sentence, an introductory first statement of this nocturne. This was, let's say, the presentation of the main character. 
and starting from the third phrase, the story starts to unfold. There will be more dynamic growth, more movement towards the culmination of this part. And as we make the connection between phrases, this one has ended and the new idea starts and develops. This was one motive and here when playing this melody already the first note is quite deep Chopin places an accent here but beware of percussiveness obviously you have to play it with a deep sound and as you play this melody you can imagine that a violin plays this very melodious connecting all the notes with one bow a bit awkward from a technical point of view so you have to practice this very well anticipation is key again and wrist navigation this has to be very soft and yet precise so you can start by practicing a bit deeper to acquire this stability and as you play you see prepare everything in advance use the magnifying glass for polishing all the turns and corners of this layout and as we play this motive we obviously create a rounded phrase shape moving forward towards this note and then the wave rolls back and with the next motive we'll keep building up the emotional intensity don't be afraid to show this bass note here. Here again use one arm stroke to connect these two octaves. This can actually feel a bit awkward in the beginning, so as you practice it you'll feel more comfortable. Try not to tense up as you play this. rises and falls for each individual motive still there should be a general dynamic growth and also a growth of emotional intensity so as the story starts to unfold this is the first step not very high another step has its individual rise and fall but still as we E flat here, the musical idea continues. We grow here and we move forward. We grow and then we have a little beautiful, breathtaking, quiet culmination. Now let's return to bar 11. I recommend practicing the right hand very well here. So that this ascending movement is played in a very plastic fluid manner without any tension or awkwardness and that there are no technical obstacles in your way to playing in a very beautiful singing manner as if a violin plays this melody also pay attention to the pace of the left hand so we have B natural C D and then even as we make diminuendo it is E so we're not going back to the tonic we're going to the sixth chord to the first inversion so we had these steps and then F everything in this seventh chord of F minor which is the subdominant of C minor without going into too many harmonic details it's very useful to listen to the harmonies this is a very important thing that you should do throughout practicing this entire piece because Chopin uses some very rich very beautiful very expressive harmonies and by listening to them very well, you will considerably enrich your performance. 
only this little shift of awareness can make a big difference. And these octaves are obviously the foundation of each harmony. So be aware of this. In most of Chopin's pieces, there are always hidden polyphonic elements. Therefore, even the accompaniment has its own development, its own melodic line, so to speak. Let's make this connection. By the way, as you play this arpeggiato, voice this upper note a little bit, because the melody goes like this. This is what you have to track with your hearing. And this are just auxiliary notes, just ornaments. We never rush them too much in playing Chopin's music. We listen to them as if they're parts of the melody, but still we have to have this view from above and not get lost among all the little notes. So the connection, music goes forward. Pay special attention to your pedal here. Here I would lift it and only press it a bit later, so not change it directly like this. You see? Sonority can be a bit dirty, but if your hearing is active at all times, your pedaling will always be clear. Let's not forget that pedaling is first of all a question of hearing. Another little technical element, as you play these two E's, make sure you don't lose the second one, which is something I noticed I was doing when practicing this piece. But at the same time, it has to be softer than the previous E flat. And our story continues. And here, play the first note quite deeply. And then grow a little bit as you play this again in a very singing manner. For me, it helps to imagine that this is played again with one bow by a violinist. Really pay attention to sound balance here. Here the distribution is a bit close together. So there should be a big gap of sound intensity between melody and accompaniment. making a little tenuto and making it on this G. So don't place a comma, so to speak, before this note, as this would create an unnatural gap in the flow of the musical idea. Instead, listen to this G, listen to this new harmonic color, and to this new dynamic intensity. And let's not forget that dynamic intensities are not just about the number of decibels. First and foremost, they express a certain character, a certain state. So we were growing here, and you'd expect something like this. And this is actually something you can do if you want. Remember, there's a lot of flexibility in the way you interpret this music. However, I do recommend the quiet culmination approach. If done masterfully, it will give the audience goosebumps. It's a very good expressive trick to use. And here, please notice that because I don't have big hands and I cannot possibly reach a tenth, I'm taking this upper A flat with my right hand, and it will be like this. once you get used to it. It's much better than playing in this manner. Crescendo piano, very melodious. And here as you play this, this ornament, listen to it very well. And don't play it like from a machine gun, so to speak. It has to be 
very expressive. And here you have several versions of dramaturgy and resulting dynamics. You'll even notice that many great pianists play this spot differently. Personally, I like this version. So we have the piano and then we start making just a little bit of growth. And as we play this D here, please notice this doesn't sound like an ending. From a harmonic point of view, it's a continuation. So I would add to the dramatic intensity here. And this will happen in only two bars here. Everything is still peaceful, but you see these two octaves are more dramatic and then here you can even reach an approximate mezzo forte and please notice what I'm doing in order to be able to play these octaves without any clumsiness. I'm taking this upper C in the right hand, there is nothing wrong with that. And here I have another interesting suggestion about dramaturgy. After playing this C quite powerfully, don't hurry to play the first note of the next phrase. Listen to this very well, allow this note to fade away just a little bit and then play dolce as indicated in the score. Until here the grief and the tragic element were intensifying and in the phrase that follows a little dreamy episode appears. It's like a shy ray of light in the midst of this gloom. So let's try to play it in a dreamy manner. How will this sound? that there is an inner smile in you. So until here everything was sad, very serious. And now this is like a bright memory, a very distant one, but it does bring a smile to the face of our hero, of the hero of this story. So here we have to voice this G very well. notice that here I'm taking this A flat with my right hand again, makes everything very comfortable. So, you can play with the tempo just a little bit here. We obviously use rubato throughout playing the entire nocturne, but here you can allow yourself a bit more capricious rubato. I like playing this grace note, not like this, but sounds again more elegant. And from here, we gradually return to the tragic element again. After this, we prepare, so from here, we start preparing the culmination of the first part of the piece. Let's connect this phrase. I would even take it from here. And listen to the harmonies. They are so beautiful here. The way Chopin uses these seventh chords. harmonies very well, enjoy them as you play, don't simply pass them by. But of course keep leading with the melody, a little crescendo and here you will 
feel this natural need to start playing in a more dramatic manner straight away but beware of this trap again hold your horses this is only the beginning of the culminating phrase so we have not arrived yet we're still getting there so this is an approximate mezzo piano and please notice we have a tiny hairpin diminuendo here that would allow us to gain that dynamic space to return to a lower level from where we can grow and reach 40 in bar 23. This has to be practiced very well, hands separately, obviously. From a technical point of view, this is the most uncomfortable phrase from the entire um, first part of the piece, maybe except for this spot here. And in the right hand, we have a little bit of polyphony here. You have to notice it and bring it out in your playing. This E natural then moves into this F, so it's just a little motive, two notes, but it is there, it enriches the musical texture and it has to be heard in your playing. So little diminuendo here and then we start growing, F growing culmination. atmosphere of the middle section. Let's work on this last phrase a bit more. So this is the beginning of the phrase. We move forward. We grow. quite a bit of rubato. I recommend playing in a more even manner as you practice in order to have this confidence, this very clear vision of what happens here. And also when I play these uh, triplet structures, I feel the need to play them with a bit more forward movement, but as you practice, play them evenly so as not to go too far from what Chopin has indicated in the score. Remember that a good rubato should always be based on very strong rhythmical pillars. So those pillars should never be broken and you should not forget what the original rhythm indicated in the score is. Here you use the intoning technique and from the point of view of fingering you have two versions here in my score. I have two second fingers in a row here, which is not a bad version if you can connect everything with the help of the pedal, with the help of your hearing. I also like playing like this, since this note is held down with the pedal, plus it's only an eighth note. So choose the version that feels best for you. Not to mention that if you have bigger hands, this version will feel better for you probably, but if you have smaller hands like I do, you're probably quite handy with all sorts of hand position changes that help you to play in a more compact manner. And as you keep practicing, as you keep using the magnifying glass method for each and every motive and phrase, don't forget about this general pulsation of the piece, about this implacable movement of time. There's a lot of inner tension in these bars here. And here we make a big diminuendo with this sequence of thirds. Don't forget to change the pedal on each one while keeping this octave held down with your left hand. And also voice the upper notes of these thirds as well. And then as you play this first chord of the middle section, obviously you'll have to voice 
with the upper voice, but we'll talk more about this in the second part of the tutorial. So, as you can see, each and every phrase from this section has its own microdramaturgy, has its own inner story, growth, culmination, and ending, and at the same time they're connected in this bigger structure, which is the dramaturgy of this first big section of the piece. In the first practice stage, you will focus more on each individual phrase and all those micro details that you have to polish in your playing. And as you acquire more comfort and freedom, you will gradually connect everything in bigger structures and try to see the forest, so to speak, bringing out that dramaturgy, which we will recap right now. So we start in a very shy manner. feeling of quiet pain, then a bit brighter, the second phrase is braver and bolder, but not too much. These two phrases together form the introduction. Then the story starts to unfold. higher and higher, but very gradually. Then we reach this beautiful quiet culmination. Crescendo dramatic. change of scenery. Thank you so much for watching and I hope that you enjoyed the first part of this tutorial. Parts 2 and 3 where I show you how to practice the middle section and the reprise in a step-by-step -step manner can be found on pianocareeracademy.com. You will learn how to master the arpeggiated chords, the impetuous movement with octave triplets and of course the challenging multi-layered rhythms. You can join my piano coaching program by clicking on the link in the description box below and get instant access to many hundreds of detailed piano playing tutorials, including progressive courses that reveal the professional secrets of the Russian piano school through my holistic approach to piano playing and lifestyle. Thank you again so much for watching. Don't forget to like this video if it was helpful for you, share your thoughts in the comments below and have a very inspired practice. See you soon. Bye!